and welcome to Pharma Television News Review here in Munich at Bar Europe 2010 on this show. I have Ed Torres, who is Managing Director at Lilly Ventures. Welcome. Thank you. Ed, uh, Lilly Ventures has been around for a while, but back in May of 2009, about 18 months ago, uh, Lilly Ventures spun out from Lilly itself as a separate entity with $200 million in it. Could you tell us why that happened and the relationship between Lilly Ventures now and the past Lilly Ventures? Sure. So we started Lilly Ventures in late 2001, and we invested in numerous companies, had several exits. We had always understood that corporate compensation and venture capital compensation were different. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't recognize the importance of that early enough. We lost two very, very good people, and we were about to lose some more. And so last May, we spun Lilly Ventures out of Lilly, we took our entire active portfolio with us and continued to exist as Lilly Ventures, both in spirit and in name, and we just created a different legal structure, a classic venture capital fund with classic venture capital compensation, and Lilly as the only current limited partner. Excellent. So clearly then, um, as you said, you had a portfolio of investments. Today you're out there investing still. Yes. Um, and the types of investments that you do, you know, the, the key question here really is, and what people will always ask is, you know, are you a strategic investor or are you just a pure there to, to make a multiple return? Yeah. You know, the usual, I'll turn your $200 million into a billion dollars, right. sir, for you. So great question because there are many different phenotypes of corporate venture firms. Sure. So in our case, we are a classic and traditional venture firm in every aspect except for one. And that is traditionally when we do due diligence, instead of checking off 12 boxes as one normally would, uh, we probably have one more box. And that is um, the majority of our investments could be of interest if in fact they turn out to be successful to Lilly someday. I say majority, you know, in any given year, probably 70 or 80 percent of what we do is in a therapeutic area of interest of Lilly today or prospectively of Lilly just because of its absolute size. So, it, 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 the, so is the other 20% really blue sky stuff? Can you, I mean, will um, you go some, into? Some is blue sky. Some, uh, a deal we did last year, uh, as an example, its lead product is in a therapeutic area, which I do not expect Lilly to ever compete in again. Um, but there was a, a platform, an underlying platform there that we thought had multiple shots on goal in multiple therapeutic areas, including ones that could be of interest to Lilly, we did the deal. Fantastic. So what does the portfolio look like now? And, uh, and, and what are your aspirations for the types of deals you want to do? So the, the very uh, classic deal for us is a company with a unique biological insight or a unique technology platform upon which they think they have multiple credible shots to get into the clinic. So we have shied away from single shots on goal, a late stage asset that only needs one phase three, that's not our kind of deal. So we typically do deals at the lead optimization, candidate selection, pre-IND study stage. We invest 10 to 15 million over the life of a deal, which typically means our first check is six to eight million dollars on average. We lead, co-lead or follow, always on the board, and we're very active investors. We're not helicopter directors. Right, okay, so that's important because clearly um, leads or opportunities can arise from both Lilly activities anyway, because they're talking to companies, or comes from other, other venture capital groups which are independent or they could be other corporate venture arms. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Does, is, there an op is, there, is there a conflict there? Is there a potential conflict? Well, clearly there's a, a potential conflict, and, and one must always separate real conflict from perceived conflict, and both are very important. And because the name of this game is reputation capital, perceived conflict is just as important for us as real conflict. And so there are two or three corporate VCs out there, including Lilly Ventures, that manage this spectacularly well. Um, and I would say we do that as well. And so what that really means is we're always seeking to act in the best interest of the portfolio company. And as you know, anybody can check on us. And so it's one thing for us to say it. It's another for a CEO or an investor who doesn't know us to check on us. So we encourage that because we know what they're likely to hear. We've had numerous instances where we have introduced 
a portfolio company to another pharmaceutical company. I call up Bristol-Myers Squibb, I call up Pfizer, et cetera. And so the track record really counts here. Um, and then as it relates to real conflict, and that does happen on occasion, and it happened to us recently uh, with a recent purchase, um, if in fact Lilly, because they're our only limited partner, is going to compete for the asset, then we step out. And it's a maddening time, as you can imagine, after being with a company sure. for five years. But because we know confidential information about the portfolio company and confidential information about Lilly, we actually can't help either one. And so we, we've you got step the, out of negotiations. We do, completely out. And um, except for the shareholder vote, we obviously wouldn't, you know, uh, participate in votes and inter interim reviews, et cetera. Right. So recently, for an example, Lilly acquired um, Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals. Yes. So we are. Which was a portfolio company. It was. It was the first time in our almost ten years of existence that Lilly has competed and won. Um, it isn't the first time that Lilly has competed, so we have a numerous chances to, uh, to be nervous and to sit on our hands as we are cut out for three weeks or four weeks or five weeks from the dialogue at the board level. Um, but we know how to manage it, and, and again, I don't want to be repetitive, but I think what's important isn't what we say, it's the way we've acted in the past and that people can check on us. Sure. Venture capital. Um, capitalists sometimes sit on boards, sometimes they don't. You've just said you sit on boards. So does that limit the number of, of, of companies that you can actually invest in? Because you know you can't sit on too many boards, I suppose. Oh, it, it does. Um, and so what we have found is the practical limit from being a good board member, as opposed to being just a board member, sure. is somewhere around five or six, it starts to get difficult. Right. Um, and that's common industry knowledge. Many people take on many more seats than that. So somewhere around five or six, we have found that we're less productive or less available to the CEO than we need to be. Right. Now, like all venture funds, there has to be a return. And is there, is there the same constraints that you have to make some or provide liquidity to some of the investments? You Absolutely. Promise? Absolutely. So uh, my sales pitch inside of Lilly is that we are a supplemental window on innovation because Lilly has many other groups that are involved with early stage companies, many represented here at this meeting. Uh, we are a supplemental window on innovation in a cost effective manner. Right. And that's because we don't cost them anything. Right. We're, you know, if we do our job correctly, we're making money with that $200 million capital commitment. Well, some, some venture funds also have numerous funds. So, so is there an opportunity that maybe that Lilly Ventures will have invest in another, uh, have another can round? Can we find some wood that I can knock on? Uh, <laughs> I think you know, we have to prove ourselves. So we yeah. spun out um, with the $200 million capital commitment. As we said earlier, um, not all of that was cash because I bought the uh, existing portfolio. Uh, we still have to go back to Lilly and pitch fund two like anybody else would pitch. And obviously, they would use the same criteria that you know, uh, others would use. Is this a group I trust? Are there soft strategic benefits that are inured to Lilly over time because they exist? And how are their financial returns? Right. Now, one of the, one of the benefits, I suppose, of doing all of this for Lilly and for Lilly Ventures itself is the ability to be able to have numerous conversations with other VCs, all of which have them, their own investments or uh, looking to invest in a whole range of different biotechnology companies and emerging companies, technology companies. So you must have now a reasonably good idea of, even in the 18 months, of what's going on in the biotech industry and, and the funding of biotech. So where, where does that leave, you know, what's, your, what's your, your perception, or maybe it's more than a perception, or feel for, for our industry right now and, and, and the level of investment and so forth? Are we, are we in a new phase for biotech? Oh, absolutely. So I, I think there are three or four ways you can answer that question. One, we've seen prices go down. Um, I think recently, uh, so we've done seven deals since we spun out last May. Not all of them are public, uh, hence a little surprise on your face. Um, but we have seen uh, prices go down since the Lehman crash in the fall of, of 08. I think we're just now starting to see CEOs and inside investors be a little bit more bullish, a little bit more confident, and be willing to push back on price. So I think that's one impact. The second and probably more profound impact is that we're all looking at each other around the table um, much more substantively. And we're asking the hard questions about, talk to me about your capital reserves. How much money do you have really 
to set aside for this company. And then the third thing is our syndicate size in terms of number investors is going up. So a deal that pre-Lehman crash in 08 would have supported maybe two major funds or three major funds. Now you will see a fourth and a fifth being added to those syndicates um, and everybody being willing to take a smaller relative ownership stake to ensure that there's deep pockets around the table if in fact we need to hold on to this investment longer. Right, so part of your decision to invest in a company is the Absolutely. fellow investors Absolutely. that are sitting on the table. Absolutely. Sitting around the table. They, Absolutely. they may get onto the table later on, but they're sitting on the table. So, um, so where does that leave us? I mean, is this, does this mean that we are slowly coming out of a poor funding uh, position, or are we continuing to My enter? My view and... is not quite that rosy. I, I do think that there are fundamentals that are changing that are in favor of the financing market, but I think we have a lot of firms, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that are walking dead, that aren't right. going, and we don't even know who they are, and they might not know who they are. Um, they're not going to be able to raise another fund. And I think um, as people begin to understand so you're talking that, about venture capital firms. Venture capital firms, firms fellow ahead. investors. Um, and so I think, as you know, once that realization is made, yeah. things change. Right. Motivations change. Commitment levels change. Right. I worry about that. So then does that mean that, that there has to be a rationalization within the industry of what companies, which companies are going to survive, not, not the VC I think firms. we're seeing that already. And what, you know, in the end, we're going to have a smaller group of companies better funded rather than a broader group of companies that are partially funded. I believe that to be true. But does that mean also that because the rise of corporate venture funds and, and arms to, to major pharma companies, does that mean that the way in which biotech companies will get funded in the future will change fundamentally? That it is not just uh, private equity, if I can call it venture arm, a, a, a division of, of private equity, and it is going to be a lot more of a mix, and the, the mix is going to be more dominantly made by the venture corporate arms of, uh, of pharma. I, I think the trends that we have seen over the last year and a half will continue. I think there are two or three uh, corporate VC funds who have been around for a long time, who are increasing the size of their investment dollars. Not, none are decreasing. Um, I think that there are three or four that were just strategic and putting in small amounts into investment rounds, right. hoping that it would lead to business development, that are now changing their phenotype to become more like a traditional, so there will be a new source of capital. And then there are literally, let me make sure I don't exaggerate, half a dozen um, big biotechs and a couple of pharmas that call me every three or four months and call my peers every three or four months because they are seriously considering uh, a fund as well. So I think the total mix change that we've seen out of necessity in terms of corporate VC and traditional VC in the last couple of years will continue. Right. So from your perspective, obviously you must believe in biotech in the future or else you wouldn't be in this game. But where does it leave us? I mean, are we... From your own vision of what you see happening over the next five years, and, and, and obviously that relates to the performance of your own fund, is what, what, what do you actually see happening? Do you see, do you, what sort of companies do we see out there being funded? So, uh, uh, I'll be happy to share my answer, but it's obviously a, an opinion sure. that not everybody shares. Right. It's more of a personal um, opinion rather it, than uh, representing. And it the, turns out to be our investment philosophy as well. Okay. Um, innovation is the key. Sure. I think we saw a slew uh, when venture capital money was cheaper, pre-fall of 2008, of uh, pharma redos, where we would take an existing drug and look for a different application sure. and uh, you know, method of use patent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We saw specialty pharma grow. Um, we are of the opinion that uh, at the end of the day, innovation is going to be the big driver uh, in the industry. And that's where you're going to see us invest. I think that there are people that share our opinion, co-investors that share our opinion, and there are others that do not. Right. So your preference is for innovation. Absolutely. And, and the, av the recent Avid success story proves it out. When we first did that deal, I can still remember at the table in 2004 having a debate 
about whether or not the AVID technology per se was going to be successful, and then having an entirely separate debate that said, will anybody care about an Alzheimer's diagnostic by the time AVID's technology is mature? So we actually placed two bets in our AVID investment. A, that the AVID technology would work, and B, that the pharmaceutical industry would have a therapeutic ready at the time that AVID's diagnostic was ready, such that people cared about the AVID diagnostic answer. Right. We took on two risks with that investment, and it paid off, right. as was obvious on Monday. Ed Torres, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.